Sound Minds Radio, getting you behind the research and ideas in contemporary life. This episode produced by Dallas Rogers. Sound Minds Radio, part of the Community Radio Network. Soundminds.com.au Have a look around you right now, wherever you are listening to this episode. Now what if I told you I could make you feel uneasy, perhaps even scared for your safety, with a few simple text messages. Would you believe me? Have you seen the news? Far out. I'm scared. Are you okay? What's going on? I don't feel comfortable here. Everyone's staring at me. You have to watch this video. At quarter to nine, just after the morning rush hour, local police were called to the Lint Cafe in Martin Place. Initial reports suggested an armed robbery was taking place. These were soon ruled out. Just after 10, images of people inside the cafe with their arms in the air, hands pressed against the windows, began to be broadcast across the country and the world. Shortly after, two hostages appeared at the window holding a black flag with Arabic script. Sam vividly remembers the moment she heard about the Sydney siege. She was at a desk, at work, and she'd just received a text message from a friend telling her to watch the news. Oh, and I should have mentioned, Sam is a young Muslim lady wearing the hijab. Instantly my heart dropped and I started to panic. Worried about how I, a visibly Muslim female, would get into my car this afternoon. It was parked 10 minutes walk away down the back streets of Liverpool. And then I started to worry about my Muslim friends and family who work in the CBD. I felt comfortable at work because I work with open-minded colleagues. But I had to make the short trip across the road to Liverpool Hospital. As I walked through the corridors of the hospital, I could see the live streaming of the siege on the TV screens in the waiting rooms and could feel people staring at me. Perhaps I was being paranoid. I wanted to get back to my office, to somewhere safe, as fast as I could. Now that wasn't Sam, but Rhonda Itawi's story, when she heard about the Sydney siege and how it affected her. Um, so my name is Rhonda Itawi, I'm a PhD candidate at Western Sydney University. For Rhonda, thinking about how events like the Sydney siege affects young Muslims in Sydney gets, well, a little bit personal. Well, I, I guess I have like a bit of a personal story as to why I pursued this research. So I guess growing up in the Muslim community uh, post 9-11, I think I was in year three at school when it occurred. And I felt that uh, my whole world turned upside down and the way I perceived belonging and the way I perceived the position of the Muslim community in Australia had completely flipped upside down. So from there, I um, started to actually experience Islamophobia personally, but I started to hear a lot of Islamophobic dialogue, not only amongst the students, but in the media as well. Rhonda is a part of the new Muslim vanguard in Sydney. Young Muslims who are researching and speaking up against Islamophobia. So what happened is I started to hear more about these experiences and I became very interested in, uh, in documenting this in understanding how experiences of Islamophobia in various forms impacts the way um, Muslim youth use public spaces in Sydney. Government policies, fear or even constructions around terrorism uh, become a reality um, out in the public space. But tonight, a new movement has taken over Twitter. It's the hashtag I'll Ride With You. And what it is, it's pretty much everyday Australians coming out in support of the Muslim community and letting them know that we stand with you and you are safe. Now, some people take issue with so-called everyday Australians coming to the rescue of Australian Muslims. But Rhonda looks at the I'll Ride With You hashtag movement in a slightly different way. Now, it started off with a, a, la a young woman in Sydney. Her name is, her tag is at Sir Tessa. After the Martin Place siege, we saw the hashtag of I'll Ride With You come out. 
And that hashtag that had around 120,000 tweets, um, I think it was December the 15th by then, uh, what we saw was a widespread uh, recognition that Muslims would face Islamophobia after that attack and that fear of terrorism would produce Islamophobia and after that young Muslims or, and Muslims more broadly would feel unsafe in public spaces. And I just felt that for the first time Australia, that the Australian public was recognising the, firstly the issue of Islamophobia but also prioritising the spatial imp implications of Islamophobia and how it impacts the way Muslims use public spaces. It was, uh, it was fascinating and of course amazing for me because it, it, was, it was I guess a validation and an inspiration to keep pursuing more work on this to start to understand how this is being produced and therefore um, try to limit these impacts. Right, so what is Islamophobia? Just a general definition would be a distaste or a fear of Islam in general and therefore um, Muslims as well um, who follow the religion. So there are a number of ways of approaching the term, um, but in terms of my research, I'm looking at Islamophobia as a form of new racism in the sense that um, it's not a racism identifiable by you know, the, the colour of your skin, but uh, more so about culture identifiers like you know, your, um, what you wear or um, stereotypes about what a Muslim should be. And therefore, I approach it as a form of racism. So Rhonda says the spaces of our cities are not just physical spaces, they're also social and cultural spaces. And the way we construct the cultural boundaries within our cities affects how people are included into, or excluded from, the city. Yeah, so um, my main research focus is on um, looking at Islamophobia and how it impacts the way young Muslims living in Western cities use public spaces. So how they engage in public spaces and how they access these areas. Learning about different theories of um, place and space, you start to reflect on those concepts in everyday life. And I started to realise that a lot of experiences people were telling me about in terms of Islamophobia, just in informal discussions, they'd always follow it with, I'll never go back there after what I experienced. Or, oh gosh, I'd never go to Cronulla. Like, we don't go to Cronulla Beach anymore. And I just started to hear a lot of these experiences. So I started to just gain an awareness of how place and space can be inclusionary and exclusionary. So you're not, you don't always belong to a certain area. And when you don't belong to it, are you willing to engage in it? So I guess I started to realize that, um, you know, I guess place isn't just a location. We don't, it isn't just a destination that we go to. It says a lot about who you are, who you belong to or with or um, who your social circle should be. And I think that's very, very strong in Sydney as an urban space overall, um, where it's kind of made up of micro publics where people you know, just belong to some, one suburb, live there, work there and, and don't move beyond that. And that's obviously not all the time, but um, I do think it's very much relevant to our city, yes. So when Rhonda talks about belonging in the city, the part of the city that she's particularly interested in is Western Sydney. And what she's finding is that some sections of the broader population of Sydney think about Western Sydney as an unsafe space, a place for cultural minorities and therefore a place to be avoided. A lot of the uh, Muslim youth I spoke to felt a great sense of safety and belonging to Western Sydney. So I, I did find it quite ironic because you have huge media reports um, demonising Western Sydney and saying that it's an unsafe place where shootings occur or murders occur. And um, when young Muslims were asked to rank different areas of Sydney, Western Sydney was actually the place that was ranked highest in, in terms of safety amongst young Muslims. It's quite ironic. Uh, I guess, but beyond that, they had the strongest sense of belonging to Western Sydney. And when I was when I probed them on why they felt Western Sydney was such a positive place to be in, it wasn't only linked to uh, the fact they lived there, but it was linked to the strong sense of cultural diversity they felt existed in that area. And with diversity, they felt a stronger sense of belonging. So um, I, I guess that really highlights that I guess diversity does encourage um, a greater sense of acceptance and belonging amongst ethnic minority groups but it also kind of showed that the perceptions of safety in western sydney and um, what is how it's constructed by the by the media isn't necessarily true or realized by people living in that area however before we get to Anne, mark latham you're first up how do we stop this where is the problem well 
Carl, it's a problem that's been a long time coming. Uh, it started in the 1980s with family reunion or unskilled Muslim migration to Western Sydney. Uh, whole or large parts of suburbs have got welfare dependency problems. And it pains me to say in Western Sydney there is a Muslim problem. After Man Monis, who came from Western Sydney after the shooting last week, we have to recognise this is not just radical Islamic ideology. Now that's former leader of the Australian Labor Party and Western Sydney cider Mark Latham talking about the Sydney siege and shooting murder of police accountant Curtis Chang outside the Parramatta Police Headquarters in Western Sydney. ...break down the welfare dependency in Western Sydney. And in many ways, it's not just the question of stopping radicalisation, it's how do we promote normality, normalisation in Western Sydney so people are making a positive contribution to society. Well, I guess at the, at the foreground of that, uh, the shooting and its context has been, the emphasis is placed on Parramatta and on Western Sydney. So firstly, not only does it feed into this, um, this discourse of Western Sydney being a dangerous place that breeds homegrown terrorists, um, you know, and in Mark Latham's words, uh, you know, Western Sydney has the Muslim problem. So what we see from, um, from that, hash firstly, the hashtag, especially on social media, is that Parramatta is placed at the, is at the forefront of that hashtag, and that place is important to it. And where, um, you know, f for example, where the young boy was um, educated was in Parramatta. Where it occurred was in Parramatta. And we're seeing, firstly, Western Sydney being constructed as, um, you know, I guess a dangerous, unsafe place where criminals are bred. And then, um, and then you see that young Muslims are the, are the ones that are living there. Um, the Muslim population predominantly live in Western Sydney as well. So that would, of course, have impacts on the construction of that place. Now, what I found the most interesting... Um, I guess outcome of this was the anti-mosque protests that were going to be con uh, were planned to um, take place in Parramatta following that Parramatta protests shooting. Protests have taken place in Parramatta in Sydney's west on the back of last week's shooting of police employee Curtis Cheng. About 20 people linked to the Party for Freedom waved signs denouncing Islam, while a strong police presence kept the group away from an opposing crowd of anti-racism protesters. But what we did see was that, um, I guess, the emphasis on Parramatta in that Parramatta shooting had impacts on, um, firstly, the local mosque and the local community and how they use those areas. So um, I had some conversations with, so with some of my friends and some relatives who were reluctant to go to the Parramatta Lanes event that night um, and were warning each other via social media to not go to, not visit Parramatta, especially if they wore the hijab or the, you know, the Muslim veil, uh, out of fear of their safety that Islamophobes might be um, encircling the area. So it did have direct implications on how they use that space, especially that day. I found, what I found fascinating about that was you had outsiders um, planning to come into a place that um, Muslims did feel safe and tell them where they can or can't access or where they should or shouldn't engage and dictate where they should feel safe or not. And I felt that that was racism kind of being practiced to a whole new level because it wasn't about Muslims invading their spaces, but it was about them even dictating how they could use their own spaces or use their own mosque. Now, that was unsuccessful. Okay, so just to set the scene here for the mosque protest. So there's a small group of about 20 or 30 anti-Muslim protesters on one side, with a much larger group of over 100 anti-racism supporters of the Muslim community on the other. And I think everyone was proud of that moment <laughs> because it, I, I guess it's just starting to, um, I, I guess there's been a shift in these attitudes. So I guess the I'll Ride With You hashtag has kind of kicked off a great, um, a, a great anti-racism movement in Australia. You've been listening to another episode from Sound Minds Radio. Produced for the Community Radio Network. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram, or visit our website, soundminds.com.au.